So maybe we... Uh, yeah, I just want to make one quick announcement about the rump session. So the deadline to register your rump session submission is today at 2 p.m. But if your slides are not ready yet, that's fine. The final slide deadline is tomorrow at noon. So all you need to submit now is just fill out the form with how many minutes you need and a title slide so that we can make the program. So if you're not going to be ready till tomorrow, that's fine. Uh, but make sure you register your talk by 2 p.m. today. Thank you. Okay, so let's start. So we have uh, this panel discussion on publication. My name is Anne Conto, and so it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this discussion. So what we would like is to discuss many issues around publications, well, the issues we are facing, and also the type of changes that we may want to do. And so, well, of course, publications, this is something which is essential for a research community because, well, a major part of our work consists in writing papers, reading papers, reviewing papers. So, and because it is so important, I think uh, it, it's a kind of uh, sensitive topic and we may have different opinions depending on our scientific area, depending on our seniority and so on. And so this is why I believe that it's very important that we try to find a kind of consensus on that. So what is the aim of this panel discussion? Of course, I think nobody expects that we will end up after one hour with a detailed system uh, on which everybody agrees. But instead, what is interesting I is that, well, because this is a problem which has many dimensions, we try to explore s some of these dimensions and try to reduce the size of the space in other words, the aim of this panel discussion is like we try to identify the major issues that we believe are important for our research community so that afterwards we can identify the solution that needs to be further investigated and further discussed, right? So before presenting our panelists, I would like to say a few words about the current landscape that we have for publications. So as you all know, our flagship publication values are conference proceedings, which are published by Springer within the LNCS series. And we also have uh, publication values, but, but for all four different sub areas. At the beginning, they were all published as conference proceedings, but two of these sub-areas, symmetric crypto and implementation, they have moved to journal publications. So now eight years ago, we have launched two new journals named Ayasura Transactions on something, for short, Task and TCHS. And so these two journals, they are published by Hoch University in, in Bochum, in, in Germany, and they follow a diamond open access model. And uh, also, uh, we have a, a much older journal, which is the Journal of Cryptology, which is published by Springer, but it, it publishes a few uh, publications, around 30 or 40 publications a year. And this year, ISR launched another a new journal, uh, which also covers all sub areas. So it, it's called uh, communi ISR Communications in Cryptology. And it, it is now public, it is published by ISR. It's also Diamond Open Access and it uses a completely, uh, a completely new publishing platform. So we also have ePrints, of course. So these are for papers. And if we look at conferences, because conferences are also very important in crypto, so we have our flagship conferences. We had major changes uh, 10 years ago because there were before single track conferences and we moved to double track and now to triple track. Concerning area conferences, well, now FSC and uh, Chess have a, a different status because these are the conferences where the papers published in the corresponding journals are presented. And something interesting is that for the very first time this year at FSC, presentation was only optional, which means that you could have a paper in the journal in which it was not presented during the conference. And last but not least, something which is uh, very interesting is that uh, 12 years ago, I think, uh, a, a completely new format of conference was launched, which is real-world crypto, because real-world crypto, this is a symposium 
with many talks, but without any papers, without proceedings. So all members on this panel, they have been involved or they are involved somehow in, in the discussions that we have on uh, this publication, because as you can see, there has been a lot of change in the, in the last 10 years. And so, well, let me introduce them. So Gregor, of course, is our program chair, and uh, he's also on this panel because he is with uh, Bochum University and he is our managing editor for TASC. Gaito, uh, he, he's here because he wrote last year or ten years, two years ago, I don't remember, he wrote a position paper with a proposal on how we could reorganize the publication landscape that we have in crypto. Alison, she serves as a vice president of ISCR and, and she is the chair of a working group on publications. Kevin, I guess you all know Kevin, he's the key person in our publication system for many reasons and one of, of the reasons is that he wrote all pieces of software that we are using for reviewing and also for this new publishing platform that is used for our communication in, in cryptology, new journal. And Cass, she's the outsider in this panel, uh, because Cass is uh, more working on security, and he, he was the program chair of CCS la last year and the year before. A and I think his point of view will be very interesting because, well, the, the community working in security, of course, is facing the same kind of issue, but in, in probably a much more crucial manner, because I think CCS this year, they received almost 2,000 submissions, which is quite a lot. Okay, and, and so before going to the discussion, well, I, I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, there has been many changes in, in our publication landscape from the very beginning in the first crypto conference in 1981. And all, or most of these changes, well, so the main, their main motivation was the growth of the community, which is something very nice because it means that, well, crypto is getting more and more important. And, and so what you can see on this picture or is the growth of the number of papers so from the very beginning, 1980 till now, of the number of published papers, the number of submissions in red, and the, the top curve is the number of ISR members. So this is logarithmic scale, be careful. But, well, what is important here is probably that uh, we can see that all these curves, they have a quite similar shape, and that they look quite regular. Well, be careful, it's logarithmic scale, but, well, you can see that they almost follow these straight lines, which corresponds to doubling every 15 years. And this is something important because we, this means that we are facing a growth of the community for sure, but it, we, we don't have something which is exceptional. If we draw the same curve for, for security or for machine learning, probably we don't have the same kind of shape. But anyway, we have this growth, and so we probably have to change something. And so our idea was to organize a discussion around three different topics. The first one would be uh, what kind of business and funding model do we want for a publication? So it's about open access, it's about uh, do we want a commercial publisher or an academic publisher, and so on. So I hope this will be the shortest topic, and then uh, we're going to move and discuss the reviewing system because uh, we want all of them, all of us, we want a high quality publication, which means that we need a, a high quality reviewing. A and it seems that uh, our reviewing system is currently overloaded, especially because of the number of resubmission. So we, uh, we, we would like to have a, a discussion about how we could handle this in a more efficient, efficient way, more efficient both for, for the authors and for the reviewers. And then the last part of the discussion will be on conferences. Okay, so let's start with uh, the question of business uh, and funding models. And maybe I will first ask Kevin to say a few words about how it works right now. A and then uh, uh, maybe uh, Gregor could say something uh, about how it works in Bonn. Okay, thank you. Uh, for some reason, I got handed the hand grenade of uh, open access to talk about. Um, <laughs> It is sort of a touchy subject, I think, for some people. I used to be a fundamentalist about uh, open access, and I'm less so now, because the world has changed a lot. 
Uh, I'm an old guy, and I remember writing papers by hand with uh, a pencil and handing them to a typist who would then type them. We would send them to a journal with something called the postal mail, and then you would, that would, they would send it out to referees with postal mail. The world started changing a lot, of course, with the development of the World Wide Web. And, um, you know, a lot of you, uh, well, some of you were maybe born after that, but, um, you know, it, it started changing things a lot. I think the open access movement started in reaction to the fact that people could distribute their papers on the World Wide Web. That was the biggest thing. Archive, uh, you know, started in like 91, something like that, and they started distributing things via FTP. I may have to explain what FTP is to people. Um, <laughs> The old guy uh, isn't remembering too much, perhaps. But um, what happened was that uh, there was starting to be pressure for open access, and the business model started changing. When I mentioned this thing about, you know, when I first started publishing, it was a pure subscription model. You would send your paper in, they would print it on something called paper. By the way, that's why they're called papers. Maybe you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, they would then bind these things into volumes and they would mail them in the postal mail. And so they would show up in your library, you would go to your library every day to see what journals showed up. The library would subscribe to those and you, know, you had to have a subscription of them, to them to be able to read them in your library. And that was the business model that was used for publishing for decades. And so it, uh, it started to change with the electronic model. We had to start thinking about how to change the model somewhat. Now, I will say that um, publishers provide a service to the community. Uh, publishers should be paid for their service, I believe. And um, there are some questions behind that. Who should pay is one question. How should they be paid? How much should they be paid? Um, there are a lot of questions surrounding this, of course. But um, I think it's reasonable to say that they should be paid something. Now, who should pay? Um, What's been happening is the subscription model has been going away, and the, the, the model has been changing toward open access with something called the transformational models. I'm not actually sure that it's transforming very much, but these are the, the new business models that have come into play where, for example, a university would pay a fee for all of their researchers to be able to publish open access in, in the, with a publisher. And, um, that is sort of a uh, publisher pay model. A lot of researchers who work at big universities are completely unaware that their library may be paying a huge fee to the large publishers for this model. And so it kind of is a way of hiding the economics of the system behind uh, agreements. I will say that it's probably a lot of overhead for the publishers also to maintain these agreements. You know, they have to have a business unit to maintain these agreements. and so. It's not particularly convenient for them either. Um, there's a question about, you know, should the reader pay, as in the subscriber model? Well, it wasn't exactly the reader who was paying then. It was the library who subscribed, and then the readers would, was sponsored by the library. They could go read in the library. And uh, then you can ask the question, should the author pay? Well, that's also a little bit discriminatory because some authors have a lot of funding and they can, they can publish as much as they want and they don't have to worry about it. And some don't have very much. So some parts of the world, of course, are really badly underfunded in research and they should be able to do science and publish their stuff. So we, find, we need to find some socially acceptable ways to fund that kind of uh, publishing. Um, I think libraries have had a long-term um, engagement in this. You know, Bochum, for example, I think they run the, the OJS system for the two journals for IACR. Um, I think there are some questions about how much a publisher should be paid. So this has become, you know, I think we have a pretty good system with, uh, with Springer. We've had a, a contract with Springer since the 80s, I guess. I think this is the 40th year that LNCS has published the, yeah, 40, 40 well, I think you own Plenum now. By the way, this is the, the Springer, Springer representative, so if you want to uh, <laughs> talk to him. You want to stand up, please? So, you think you see him. so we've had a, a pretty good relationship with Springer all these years. You know, they published the Journal of Cryptology and they published the LNCS proceedings. And so we've been doing this for a long time with them, and we have a contract with them that, you know, spells out what their responsibilities are and what we get out of it. and 
um, how the money flows and this sort of thing. But um, if you look at how a paper gets paid for, it could be through a variety of different mechanisms. It could be that the author pays a, an open access fee. It could be that the library pays this transformational agreement. It could be that you get access to it as an IACR member. There's a lot of different ways, and you pay the IACR for your membership in order to be able to get access to that. There's a lot of different ways that things can be paid for. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of complaining about the cost of some of these publications, and I'll do some of that complaining, but I'm not gonna direct it at Springer necessarily. So they have a flagship, they, spring, they changed their name to Springer Nature, I think in part because they have this flagship journal called Nature, which has very high cost for publishing in that, but has very high prestige, mostly in other fields other than, you know, in the sciences, other than computer science or mathematics. But uh, the cost to publish in that is very, very high. Cost to publish in other things is less. They have their, their fees through a variety of uh, mechanisms. Um, I think it's more interesting to look at how professional societies work. So right now, ACM is going through a change where they're changing to an open access model. In the past, they had a subscription model. You had to pay to subscribe to the digital library that they have and you would get access through that. Usually it's the universities who pay the subscription fee. And now they're changing to an open access fee where the, the author will pay. And their fees are actually quite high. I'm gonna say more about that maybe in a rump session talk. But um, their fees are like 1,300, in 2026, they'll be like $1,300 per paper. And if you're a non-member, it'll be $1,800 per paper. So you can ask the question like, why is it $1,300? Why is it $1,800? That, that's sort of a strange number. It seems like a, a very large number to me. But I think what the societies do is they use this revenue stream to fund other activities. So for example, if they want to have a program in diversity for women at uh, underfunded universities, they need to raise funds for this kind of program. And they will use their, their funds from uh, publication in order to fund these activities. And uh, there's an interesting blog post that was written, I think it was in the, maybe in CACM, about uh, ACM's budget. It's very interesting to go look at that. They, they bring in all this money from publications, but they spend a lot of money in other things. The other thing is they have staff to manage a lot of these actions, and so that staff can be expensive. Um, on the other hand, if you look at how IACR runs, we're essentially almost 100% volunteer effort. So we have people doing volunteer work. I, I happened to retire six years ago and I've been volunteering almost full time for ICR, probably be, because they gave me a boost early in my career and I wanted to give back to the community. But we have other people who are doing a lot of work. You know, we have some here who are doing a lot of this volunteer work, right? We have the general chairs, we have the program chairs, we have the people on the program committees. We have a lot of people doing this volunteer work. And IACR does not try to make money out of their publications, right? We want to make sure that the publications get read. And as an author, you want to make sure your publications get read. The best way to do that is to make sure everybody has access to them. So this is one of the reasons why people are clamoring for open access. And finally, I think I want to close about saying that there's also pressure from the funding agencies. So people who put together funds to give to the researchers, so the, you know, like the National Science Foundation in the US, they will, have, they will fund a lot of research and there's an interest in having that research that's paid for by citizens being accessible by citizens. And so they are pushing very hard for open access right now. I think it's being pushed probably harder in Europe than it is in the US, because in the US, we primarily worship at the altar of capitalism. And so we, we sort of you know, don't want to get in the way of, of that kind of capitalism. But I know that there has been a, a bill that's been introduced in Congress since like 2006 to make sure that all research that's funded by the US government is made available to US citizens, and it dies every time. And, but I think in the last couple of years, the Office of Science and Technology Policy under the President's uh, administration has put forward papers saying how it's going to change the nature of scientific publishing to go to open access models. They are also pushing for it too. Whether it bears fruit in the future, I don't know. I, I, I found out just this week that there is some conflict in the uh, contract that ICR has with, um, with Springer for how the publication copyright is handled. Uh, Martin brought this to my attention. And um, it has to do with how the copyright is assigned. 
well, you know, we'll have to address these things. This is in conflict with um, Coalition S, which is trying to push for open access, and they have some specific requirements for how these things be done. This will work out in the future, I predict. And I think, actually, IECR has a pretty good portfolio of publications. They're really pretty well accessible. And especially ePrint makes things very accessible. Those are not the official versions. Those are not the ones you should cite. But you can read papers there. And if you're an author writing a paper for some conference or journal, you are an idiot if you don't put it on ePrint. And by the way, I'd like to call attention to Christian Kashan, who actually started ePrint. He deserves our thanks every day. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's a great... There's a little bit of conflict there about versions of papers. So sometimes we have this 30-page limit on a paper, uh, and I think Kenny mentioned, you know, he has a 50-page paper or something, so it can't fit in the proceedings. So what happens is sometimes there's a short version, which is the, quote, official version, and a longer version might appear on ePrint. So if you're trying to cite something, it's not clear whether you should cite the long version or the short version. You should try to cite the official version, because let's be honest, all of us are rated in various ways. There are statistics used for rating us. You know, how many citations do you get? How many papers do you publish? How prestigious is the journal that you publish in? And we should make sure that our citations actually give proper credit to the publications that are out there. But I think I'm quite optimistic about the open access model, and I think IACR has a pretty good position there. I think we have a pretty good relationship. Maybe need some tweaking over time, but I think we're in pretty good shape. Thank you. Maybe Gregor yeah. could add some words. Yes, so um, th there's not so much I can add. So maybe I can tell a bit about the motivation why we started to, to publish uh, TOSC and TCHES at, at RUP. So at, at Bochum. So one of the reasons was certainly these crazy uh, fees that, uh, that uh, publishers take, and we thought that cannot be the real number. And we tried to, because at the end it's tax money that I felt was maybe wasted and maybe invested better. But it was also that we, by doing it ourselves, we have full control over, over the whole workflow of the papers. Yeah? So, for example, copy editing. I'm not sure that everybody is always happy the way we, we get copy editing done by Springer in a short time. And I mean, there, there are problems around this, and I understand that, that this is a service that has to be done, but I think maybe it's, it's nice to have it in our own, own hands. And so it was a long process uh, in Bochum, because at the beginning we didn't know what it means to publish a paper. Yeah? So is it just put it on the website, or is there what else is there to it? And it turns out it's not so complicated. So we have, uh, we still have some, and that's not counted in the cost. We still do some uh, uh, copy editing, and uh, this is uh, done mainly by um, my uh, permanent postdoc, uh, Christoph Bayerle. So I want to uh, thank him a lot for uh, doing this. Um, not always very nice work of running behind authors to maybe uh, provide their full. Um, full um, full name and uh, address and these things, but I think that that works nice. And uh, and I forgot what I wanted to add. No, I think I think it's uh, the, all the tools that that were now developed for the communications in cryptography. They they are very helpful in reducing these costs even even more. And I think that's really a very fruitful and and a good way forward for our publications. Thanks. I'm very curious about what you think, whether you think this question of open access and academic versus uh, commercial publisher is an important issue or not. So, so maybe you can raise uh, your hands. Uh, who, think, who, who doesn't care and thinks it's a minor issue and we don't care? Uh, of uh, this question of open access and, and uh, choosing the publisher. And so, and who thinks it's something that needs to be further discussed or that uh, ISR should? Uh... Let me ask a separate question. How many of you have received pressure from your funding agencies about open access? Okay, so, uh, yeah, and uh, it would be inter interesting to, to ask the same question at crypto, for instance, to see whether... Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> Okay, uh, well, 
I, I propose that we take all, all comments uh, from, the, from the audience at the end, or, or except if there is a very quick comment uh, on this specific topic. Otherwise, we'll move to the next one, which is a question of uh, reviewing. Uh, as I said, we, well, the quality of uh, publications is, is, of course, depends on the quality of reviewing. And it seems that our, review, our reviewing system is really overloaded by rest submissions. So uh, we computed some statistics here. You see that uh, uh, something like of more than 40% uh, of the paper rejected at this Eurocrypt have been resubmitted to crypto. And among them, roughly 30% of the papers have been accepted to crypto. And so, well, of course, the, the other 70% have been rejected. And, and, and uh, well, uh, Kevin also identified some papers which have been submitted at least uh, at seven different uh, conferences. And so it seems that this is uh, quite a waste of time for the authors and for the reviewers. And so the question is, how could we handle this kind of resubmissions in a more efficient way? So maybe Cass can say of, uh, how it, it works, because I think you have the same kind of issue. Uh, so we definitely had an issue in the security conferences with the, re the resubmissions of papers, but this led to two things. Some conferences have picked up the, the major revision model, and in fact, CCS dropped this model again, because what we were seeing for the major revision model was that a lot of the reviewers would converge to major revision as the sort of the easy way out, where they, it's sort of a neutral, sorry. Yeah. Good, thank you for the question. So what is the major revision model? That's a very good question. So the major revision model, the idea behind it was that you can submit a paper to a conference and it maybe isn't good enough to get it done and fixed in the particular cycle to get it for that particular instance of the conference. You get more time to revise it and then it will get reviewed again and then maybe it goes into the next cycle of the conference. So some conferences still have this. This calls, includes USNICs and SMP, but they actually have the opposite problem now. There is a problem that you submit a paper and reviewer two rejects it. You try to resubmit it next time and reviewer two says, this looks like a paper I already know, so I'm gonna essentially cut and paste it in the same review, even if you worked hard on improving it. So I think there is a double-edged sword here to major revision. So one, in one sense, it allows you to keep a system in your uh, paper in your system and allow people to improve it over time with help of the reviewers to get it to a state where it gets accepted. That is great. If you hit the wrong reviewers, you sometimes want new reviewers. So I think the security community hasn't really decided, um, but I can tell you now, USNICs and SMP now have a new rule that says if you have rejected as a PC member a paper in a given cycle, and you see that paper again, you should not review it this round. That is a new rule since the last one year, I think since last year, and that is exactly trying to counter that you hit the same negative reviewer again. So I think you know, this can go both ways. Maybe Gaito? Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, first I want to say that in TOSC we also have this uh, major revision model, and I think we're relatively happy with it. It was a bit hard at the beginning. We also tended to give too many major revisions, and then at the second round we, we, we didn't really know what to do. But I think this has improved over time, and now we, we give clear instructions where we ask for, a, when we ask for a major revision, we try to give clear instructions to authors about specific issues that we want to be fixed, with the implicit assumption that if they fix it, then the paper will be accepted. And this should be issues that can actually be fixed, not just uh, make a, be a better paper. That, that's not a valid uh, reason for a major revision. So that's what we're doing now in TOSC. And uh, more generally, um, I think one of the issues with the conference model, uh, in particular in, uh, in cryptography, we have three major conferences, Crypto, Asia Crypt, Eurocrypt. And the three conferences are quite similar. Uh, I mean, they have the same scope. They have basically the same level of quality required to be accepted. And they're also all run by the same organization, IACR. And I think this is relatively unique. It's not the same situation in, uh, in security. And, but we still run them as independent conference. Each of them has a separate PC, and each of them only takes decision for the current conference. So you submit a paper, and three months later, you have a decision for the specific conference you submitted to. And I think this really creates uh, problems, because you have to take a decision, and then if a paper is rejected, it moves to a different conference, and you restart from zero the, the whole process. 
And so this requires new reviewers who will spend more time looking at the papers, and uh, it also means sometimes it, you have to wait a long time before your paper is accepted. And one way to, to maybe improve the situation is to have more cooperation between the conferences. And we've actually starting, started uh, moving this way. A few years ago, we gave authors the option to, to, to use a sticky review, so to send again the reviews from a previous conference. I don't think it's been used a lot or, or has been very successful, but it's been at least an experiment. And uh, more recently, we've started uh, giving uh, reject and resubmit decisions to some paper, like some papers submitted at Eurocrypt. We've said to the authors, well, your paper is rejected, but we encourage you to submit to crypto, and one reviewer will be uh, still assigned to your paper in the new conference. So that's a way to have more uh, communication and more memory in the system. And I think if we want to go further, uh, we, we will have to somehow integrate more the three conferences. And maybe an option would be to have a single uh, submission and publication pipeline for the three conferences together where you submit your paper once, and then you get a decision. Either it's accepted uh, in, as it is, or maybe you get a revision decision, so you have to resubmit later and improve your paper, but with clear instructions how, on how you should do it. And then you get the same reviewers, so you, we don't waste too much time. Or your paper is rejected, and then probably you're not allowed to submit uh, directly after being rejected. So I think this would really help the review load and also be useful for authors to not spend too many time resubmitting the same paper and hoping to get more lucky uh, for the next time. And so, of course, this will be a relatively big change, but it's also not so radical. Basically, it means we would have a big PC, maybe 200 or 300 people that would stay maybe for one year or maybe with some overlap. I mean, there are many variables to discuss, but basically a big PC for one year for the three conferences. And so they can take a decision that affects the other conferences because currently it's independent PC, so you cannot, the, the Eurocrypt PC cannot say you cannot submit to crypto because it's a different PC, so it's, I think it wouldn't really make sense. So, but by, by merging them, then we get the ability to, to take decisions like this. Uh, we could also uh, maybe have, uh, for longer paper, take more time to decide. That's something we do in, uh, in TOSC and THS. If you submit a very long paper with, with long proofs, then the reviewers can ask for more time before uh, giving a decision. So I think that would be something interesting to at least to think about and maybe to move towards this direction. When we think about how the conference, so that's for the publication side. On the conference side, I think we, we will discuss this more later. But an easy way is to say just when your paper is accepted, you go to the next conference after acceptance. That's an easy solution. Another easy solution is to give offers the choice to go to one of the three conferences as they choose. And this could also be good for people who try to reduce uh, their travel for many different reasons. Um, and yeah, those are the two main options and we can be more radical even and maybe we'll discuss this after. So that's... Thanks. Any other comments or... Yeah. No, only very briefly, I, I'm a big fan of moving to one unified uh, crypto, Euro crypt, Asia crypt. Uh, I think it would solve uh, all these issues. I think it's better for uh, the reviewers. Maybe it's, but I can say this easy now, but uh, maybe it's worse for the program chairs, but uh, not my problem anymore. And uh, <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's better for the reviewers, it's better for the PC, and it's also better for the authors, because in, in Tosk it's really nice that you have this clear, uh, clear um, rules, what you have to change your paper to get it accepted, so it's much less frustrating than getting a different set of r reviews with different set of changing conditions, and you change your paper along the way to get it accepted, and then you get uh, unclear, unclear messages. I think it would be a very, very good uh, idea to move in this direction. Um, I, I am in this peculiar position of being one of three people who has the root password on submit.icr.org, and I don't submit papers to those. So, But in this discussion about trying to quantify the problem of resubmissions, I did a little bit of a data analysis on the submissions that have been in there. It's a little difficult to tell when you have a resubmission of a paper, but I took the, the just the basic idea, if the title had not changed substantially and the list of authors was the same, and I saw it in two different venues, then I counted that as the same paper being resubmitted. That's a proxy, of course, because the title sometimes gets changed and the initials get changed in the authors and that sort of thing. But 
It was interesting to look at that data because uh, you had mentioned that there were two papers that were submitted seven times and rejected seven times. So that's not a great outcome. But there were also two papers that were submitted six times and on the sixth time they got accepted. Now, I think this is an interesting phenomenon. What that means is somehow either the paper had evolved and had improved in response to the reviews and finally got to the point where this was a reputable paper and really should be published, or else there's a certain amount of randomness in the process, which I think is true, and there are actually studies now of peer review systems to try to analyze exactly how much randomness there is in the process. So NeurIPS did this thing where they split the PC into two sections and they had them both review the papers and they came out with very different results. And I think part of the reason is because a lot of it is opinion based, it's subjective, and there's a certain amount of probability associated with this, whether you resonate with the particular reviewers that are on the committee. And um, I think this is not a perfect system, but if in these examples of the papers that were submitted six times and finally got accepted, those papers are getting better, that's how science is supposed to work, right? We actually started with crypto and Eurocrypt, there was a pre-proceedings at the conference, and the proceedings was only published after you had given your talk, and then you had the chance to revise it with, uh, with feedback from you know, people who had heard the talk. And we switched at some point in like 1990 or something to actually have the proceedings available at the conference. But it wasn't like that originally. It was this, it's this idea of taking revisions, taking suggestions for improving the paper, and then the end result will be better. Or, or is there a quick comment on, on this topic uh, from the audience? Yes, Martin. So at which point do you think that uh, ignoring reviewer comments when you resubmit becomes unethical? That's a very good question, yeah. I think I'm going to decline to make statements about when something is unethical. <laughs> but I would say for tasks it works, or for journals in general it works pretty well, because when you have a resubmission and if you have very clear instructions then you can say, okay, you, you didn't take into account the reviewer comments and makes sense. Yes? So just a follow up to Martin's question, would requiring sticky reviews, would this do something about this? I'm kind of on the fence about this one because I think you have a chance to have an independent review and toss the coin differently to see if there's some audience for your paper that likes it. So I sort of like the idea of having an independent review start from scratch. But that imposes a big review load because then somebody else has to look at the paper from scratch. But I think if you have bad reviews that are become sticky, that can be very detrimental to the system also. Maybe Gaetan and... I guess there's also an issue of uh, maybe confidentiality, like when you write a review, you expect that it will be read by the authors and by the PC, but not necessarily by a different PC. So maybe that's something that we will have to discuss at some point if, if we want to go this way. Yeah, I would also say, I think there is, of course, a trade-off here because we're, conf we're making one policy to address a lot of sort of different cases. One case is the, you know, the author's just trying to avoid making changes that might need to be changed. But the other case is the randomness, as Kevin mentioned, of something that's just like, you know, not to the reviewer's taste or somebody just feels like this is, this is correct, but I don't think it's interesting enough for crypto, which I know we've all had that review. Um, and there's some value in getting a fresh, you know, push of the button or, or roll of the die. Although I don't think that's incompatible with the two systems because we could have some kind of system where you authors get one sort of chance to hit the button and reset or something. And other than that, it's sticky. So, but I do think there's, you know, there's a value to be preserved in fresh eyes. And I, I think it would be hard as a reviewer if you're already reading somebody saying, eh, it's correct, but it's not very interesting. Like that is going to color your perception subconsciously of whether it's interesting, whereas if you read it fresh, you might, um, you might think differently. I just wanted to ask a question to the audience. In some fields, it's common to publish reviews. And so you could adapt a model of peer review so that when you write a review, it actually becomes public and associated to the paper. That might change the nature of reviews. It might make them worse. It might make them better in some ways. But I also think we have this problem that reviewing is a lot of work. 
Like, how many of you have had an account on a hot crap for a PC on, on IACR? Yeah, you want to count all those hands? There's a lot of volunteer work being done out there. It is a lot of work to do these reviews, and uh, it would be nice if people got credit for doing these reviews, if you were recognized by the community. We publish the PC for, for a conference in computer science, and so it is a public record that you have done this work, but you're not associated with exactly that review, so it's pretty good in this situation, but if you look at the classical model used by the Journal of Cryptology, for example, the paper goes into the editor, the editor sends it out to an anonymous reviewer, who really doesn't have much incentive to do a good review, right? They're never gonna be recognized. They're gonna be recognized by the editor who will thank them for doing the review. But I've read in many fields, it's getting impossible to find anybody to do anonymous reviews because they don't get any credit for it. The incentive system has to be there. I'm sorry. Um, to latch on to that for a bit. Uh, so USENIX and CCS are now giving more distinguished review awards out and giving people a plaque and saying that this is something you can put on your CV. And we're talking about, say, 10% of the reviewers, also to incentivize people to give good reviews out. So we're trying to facilitate that a bit. Maybe we're gonna take two quick comments from the audience and because we have to have some okay. time. For um, my comment is, is essentially in the same direction, I think, uh, I was just going to comment on this idea of having a single PC for all uh, three ICR conferences. I would expect that uh, this this is a big change and that it would meet quite some resistance. But um, for example, uh, just uh, making the entire body of uh, reviews from one conference uh, available to the next conference, even maybe without passing it on to the even next conference, <laughs> uh, you know, to the, the second one. Uh, that would, would already probably uh, reduce reviewing workload. Thank you. It's very difficult to do that yeah. in respect. It's difficult to do that and respect the conflict of interest that's encoded into, into this system. I have a technical comment about this revise and resubmit feature that, well, at least I saw for the first time at crypto this year. So I'm I'm expecting that, like, for instance, I'm assigned for the revise and resubmit paper, or I was the one well, like, telling that this paper should be revised, but I'm not in the committee for the next, let's say, Asia Crypt in this example. That means that program chairs should kind of find me somehow and ask me to review, but that entails a probability that the new program chair is in conflict for this paper. How do you resolve that? <laughs> so I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I'm just, I just wanted to say that for all these complicated uh, considerations, actually at Eurocrypt, uh, this Eurocrypt, we did not opt for this uh, revised uh, resubmit because we thought it's, I mean, the idea is nice, and I just said that I'm a big fan of, of moving to this model. But if you do it in these small experimental uh, tries, I think the overhead you, you cause is much, uh, much higher than, than the benefit you get. This is why we didn't do it. Yeah, yeah but I think it's doable, because we have program chairs, we have uh, also now our chairs, so we can handle conflicts this way, I guess. So we will move on to uh, the last topic, but uh, before I would like to know how many amongst you thinks that, well, it, it makes sense to further discuss and uh, investigate this question of having a single pipeline between all, all three uh, flagship conferences, or, or whether people think it's a stupid idea and that we need to forget about it. So how many thinks that it's uh, an idea that uh, it, it's not interesting and that we need to forget about it? And, and how many of you think that, well, we need for some further discussion about that and, and see whether we can do something? Okay, good. And, well, last but not least, maybe is the uh, so most difficult issue, I don't know. Uh, it's about conferences. Uh, of course, we have conferences. I think we all think that our conferences are very important, but we have a problem of scalability of course, and so we, we have to understand what we could do, so, and uh, there are many questions around that. So first of all is, why do we think conferences are important? What are the main roles of conferences? Is that just to listen to presentations or, or just 
to meet uh, people. Uh, uh, we need to understand whether we think it could be a good idea to have uh, this kind of, uh, uh, to, to de decouple papers and presentations, or do we want to stick to the idea that uh, each paper should have a talk at the, at the conference, and, and depending on this, uh, the answer to this question, we may, well, investigate many, many possibilities. So maybe Alison could start on that. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, like I love our conferences in a way that I didn't understand until I had to go to finance conferences for my other job. And now my husband doesn't even ask the question when I'm packing my bags of like, are you going to a crypto conference or a finance conference? He just says, is it the good kind or the bad kind? <laughs> um, so I think we have a lot of great aspects of our conferences to preserve both, you know, the dissemination of research that happens, but also, you know, the networking and the social events and the sort of sense of community that we have. Um, and when I asked students in a survey after Crypto 2022, what were sort of the most important elements of that experience, um, everybody ranked sort of the opportunity to network with peers and network with senior researchers as the top and, and um, listening to talks as the bottom. <laughs> so just, just to give you some context on these discussions, I think you know, what we're facing at a organizational level and at a board level is a sort of growing tension between um, um, some of the elements of the conference experience, because as you can see from this move to triple tracks, we're starting to outgrow in size uh, some of these kinds of venues, and something that comes with you know the um, the sort of uh, easiest lever to pull perhaps is just to have more tracks and or sort of make conferences longer. There's a lot of expenses that happen with that and it's not really a linear scale. It's kind of a jump because when you graduate beyond these kind of venues to venues that can hold the kind of conferences um, that would need four tracks, five tracks, um, there's a lot less competition in that market and expenses go way up. And so we reach this tension between uh, sort of acceptance rates compared to you know the submission growth that we're seeing uh, versus the in-person uh, experience in terms of how much time is spent in talks versus other elements of the program and then also um, versus the cost to attendees and we have to sort of think about these problems way in advance because we're now you know booking venues and making plans for conferences about three years in advance so we're trying to sort of predict where things are going to be in three years and try to figure out among these you know these different elements of the conference experience how do we prioritize and how do we um, and how do we change things? And so that's just the context. And I think it's it's a hard topic because you know um, the best solution would be to not have the scalability problem. And as soon as you have the scalability problem, you have this multi-dimensional space of these trade-offs, and we probably each have a different individual point in that space that we'd personally prefer. Um, but I think what we would most like feedback on from the community is trying to get a sense of, you know, which of these levers are um, sort of more acceptable to pull versus others. So like, it's preserving acceptance rates, which obviously changes in the world where there's one coordinated journal, um, is preserving, you know, the talks being a standard length or everybody having a talk versus poster sessions. Like, what of those things are most important to people? Because as things continue to grow, um, you know, and as we've seen in the security and um, and knock on wood, not yet <laughs> in our community, what we're seeing in the machine learning community, um, you know, a lot of these things are going to, are going to have to evolve. Maybe Cass about uh, these large security conferences? Well, I do think the graph we saw on the growth, I think doubling every 15 years is a little bit misleading because what we're seeing with places like CCS is that there is a huge component of applied crypto papers. So I think this year is around 15%. So if IACR wants those people or say they motivated by Kenny's talk and they want these papers to come back to IACR, then you're gonna you're get right. that growth there that's gonna be bigger. And in fact, I think that for CCS, they want, you know, they don't want that segment to grow necessarily further than it has. So I think you'll see additional growth. Um, and I think then the only way out is to go to more concurrent tracks or to have a subset of the papers. USNIX will experiment next year for the first time for not having every paper presented um, because they are facing this exact thing. CCS will move to 10 concurrent tracks this year already in terms of 10 different rooms where the talks will be. So that's, that's where this is heading. So pick your poison and yes, opinions are welcome.
I just want to mention, people may not be aware of it, but there are conferences like NeurIPS that are getting over 10,000 submissions. Right? This is a mind-boggling number that uh, when it reaches that kind of scale, it's really not clear how you can run a conference at all. Who else or some comments from the audience? Maybe I would like to suggest a very small uh, change we can do that will slightly maybe improve the situation. Uh, maybe we could not require authors to present their papers. If some authors don't want to present, we could give them this option. That's what we're doing currently in TOSC. And actually, everybody decided to present, so it didn't solve the problem. But, uh, <laughs> but, but maybe it can give a little bit of room for growth, and also it can be good for people who don't travel for a variety of reasons. It's more inclusive if we can say, you can publish here, and if you don't want to come, that's fine. We don't care. So I don't know if people would agree with that or if... What do you think? Would you agree with this uh, possibility of uh, having a publication without uh, mandatory presentation? Okay, and uh, who, who would be uh, against that? Okay, thanks. Please. Hi. Um, I think it's really important that people are able to not present if they don't want to for caring responsibilities or reasons that they might not want to travel to Santa Barbara. Um, but the other thing I was thinking of is if we go towards uh, presenting posters or no presentations, we risk that, for example, PhD students and those with, with less funding are then not able to attend conferences and participate in all of the, you know, all the bits that aren't watching the talks that, that we enjoy and, and the great things that we gain from doing that. So yeah, I think maybe it also requires an institutional change in like the attitude towards, for example, presenting a poster. My uni's just like, mm, I guess you can, but like, why you wanna do that? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's maybe a bit of a nitpick on wording. So I think it is very important that every paper of a conference gets presented at the conference. I don't think that has to be necessarily in the format of a talk. So that's exactly the difference. And also, when, when Cass said not every paper at USNIC is presented, they are actually all presented, but many of them in the format of a poster presentation. So I think that's, that's a dis distinction there, also in the question that you just asked, that is kind of important to make. Serge. Okay, so I was quite interested about this uh, logarithmic law, so the, the law that uh, the number of papers double every 15 years. I don't know if we can call it the Cantos law or something. <laughs> no, uh, uh, it's Gaetan's law. <laughs> okay, Gaetan's law. Uh, but I wonder also why is the registration fees doubling as well? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I just also wanted to add to, to context for the presenting every paper. There are a lot of industry companies right now who are refusing to fund researchers if they're not presenting. So that is also a challenge of getting the senior people and industry people to the to the conference if we if we make that change. I think Kenny actually answered the question about Kenny answered the question about why conferences are doubling. We're not in Kansas anymore. You know, we go to pretty expensive places. So I just wanted your opinion on one extreme end of the scale. So see, so let's say that all publication uh, or most publication goes via uh, the CIC, and when you submit, uh, you tick a box saying, "Well, given the opportunity, I would like to hold a talk at one of the ICR flagship conferences." Is this a good idea? And if not, why not? Personally, I think it's a good idea to integrate even more than just the three flagship conference, and we could also have the earlier conferences in the same system, and you just submit to one place, and depending on the perceived quality of your paper, you get different opportunity for presentations. I think that would be a good system, yes. But of course, that's a big change, so there, there might be some resistance. I don't know. I would go so far as saying I, I think it's I think it's good or bad. I think we don't. It's very hard to predict what the conferences would look like in that world in terms of. And I, I will just bring up one sort of shift that we have seen in just conference attendance is like post COVID, we're seeing a much higher ratio of student attendees versus non student attendees, which I think having more students is is great. It changes the finite another reason why you know might see differences in registration fees is, you know, it's very core to our mission that we keep it affordable for students and they pay less. And so when that when that composition changes, the cost structure also changes. And I think part of part of this also has to be 
you know, what, think, what value do we think there is in incentivizing and, and finding ways to bring the more senior community to the conferences to interact with students. And I think that's one of the things that is potentially challenged by a system where, you know, we decouple the, um, the paper publication from the conference. So just, which is not to say it's an insurmountable problem. I think it's just something we have to have an independent solution to in that world. Yeah, please. For me, it's more like the question of presenta uh, presenting a paper is like thinking of the real world crypto than having good talks. So if we could reduce that everybody does not have to present, but that they present good talks so that everybody can get something out of it. Um, I just wanted to make uh, t two comments. One was on the presentation of papers, uh, just that exchange with Kaz and Peter. Um, uh, I, re I work for Springer. We talked twice this year to Clarivate Analytics about their requirements for their Web of Science rating for conference content. And they said, that basically, there must be an opportunity for the paper to be challenged. So you can't have a video, for example, uh, but I think it allows for the possibility of a poster. Um, so that's just something to think about. If there's some chance for too many presentations, please see my poster in the afternoon session, but there has to be an opportunity in that sort of academic, scientific presentation uh, uh, mode. Yeah. Just to respond to that, so the idea would indeed be to make it more clear that everybody would present, but this would be either a poster, but not in the classical sense, but it means poster of accepted paper, and then you could go up to these people and discuss, or like a, a, a presentation slot where you give a talk. So these are the two options. Okay, yeah, Matt. thank you, Kaz. Uh, I think this, uh... We could, for example, run something, I actually started to set up discuss.icr.org as a forum where people could discuss papers. And I think someone else has also created, uh, I forget what the, the URL was for that, a place where papers on ePrint could be discussed. And so there is a chance for, now that we have the internet, we, we have a chance for rebuttal to take place in a much broader context, in a much more permanent way. And in some ways, I think just offering a chance to heckle a, a speaker at a conference is not as good as some of the alternatives. And so I think that Clarivate should perhaps be more open to other forms of rebuttal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we exchange with Clarivate on many things. They're not that open to anything. Um, but you know, I just wanted to offer that as a comment because the, you know that's, that's really not a Springer thing. And if I could just get back to a, a Springer comment on the open access. I just wanted to paint a picture of what's currently available and then to ask the question, what is the goal of open access in addition to that perhaps for? Uh, like what's the motivation for that? Currently, in the arrangement between Springer and IACR, authors of papers can put the author accepted manuscript available anywhere. They can put it in archive, they can put it in HAL. It, it can go into the ePrint for IACR. So that's green open access at both the author level and at the society level currently. Currently, the version of record, which is the Springer publication, is, as we speak, the Eurocrypt content is freely available to the whole 8.5 billion on the planet. So it's, it's currently open access without a gold payment to us. So the, so the payment numbers on, on that, Kevin, basically, we're not, we're not charging anybody for gold open access for that right now. So that's two months currently, it's, it's open to everybody. And two years after publication, again, our version of record is open to everybody. So there's only 22 months when the Springer version of record is available only through Springer Link subscriptions. So the question would be, and I know some people have this, what would gold open access be needed for? Now, some countries are mandating that, but so far the mandating and transformative deals, the project deal in Germany, for example, is only including uh, 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 journal articles. It does not include conference papers. The UKRI on April 1st, 2022, mandated um, a CC BY on publication without embargo for conference papers because I, uh, LNCS has an ISSN. At the same time, they said, because the volumes have ISBNs, then they're books, so we're not going to fund it. So the funders so far, at least in the short and medium term, don't seem to be uh, in a position to fund Gold Open Access. And therefore, if you're in the Netherlands, if you're in uh, Germany, UK, California, there's a few places where gold open access is being pushed. So far, the representative bodies, including ACM, have not succeeded 
in getting the funders to actually fund conference paper content. Th but, thanks, but, but uh, uh, be because I see people are leaving. I, I, I would like to come back to the topic of conferences because I, I, I think we need your inputs for that. So thanks okay. a lot. Yeah, <laughs> We're running out of time. I'm right, sorry. Okay. 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 Uh, I, I'm sorry. Well, just uh, to, to have a uh, just a. a rough idea for, for the people remaining in the room, who thinks it, 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 that we really need to have the same kind of presentation for all papers in the conference, or whether we need to have a different treatment. So having the same kind of presentation would mean having a, a more tracks or, or having shorter time slots. Just uh, there's a slight distinction between having all papers presented the same and having all papers giving the same opportunity of being presented the yeah. same, so and then letting the authors choose. But. So let's let, yeah. So let's have this question: Who who thinks we should give the same opportunity to all papers uh, to be presented somehow in a conference? Which uh, but well, understand that it means having more tracks and, and or having shorter slots. Who thinks it would be nice? And who thinks it's better to make a distinction and have two kinds of presentations, two kinds of papers? OK, well. And so who, who? She just asked who's willing to pay $2,000 for it. Uh, but uh, no, who, who, who thinks it, it's, it would be possible to have shorter time slots? I, I don't know what it means. Uh, for Eurocrypt in Zagreb, we had 10, 10 minutes. But it was, well after or just during the pandemic. So this, this is why and we, we, we had this uh, uh, specific format. But well, it, it, it was different. It, it worked pretty well, but it, it was really something different. So who thinks it, 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 it's feasible to, well, it makes sense to have this very short presentation. And, and who thinks it, it doesn't make any sense because it's much too short? Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> okay. There are other options too. We can offer other methods of presentation. So we can, for example, allow authors to upload a video and host that. Um, you know, that's a thing that's relatively recent, but and it takes a little bit of work to do that. But it is an alternative presentation. And I think we've done this. We've experimented with this in ICR conferences, especially during COVID, when we had to experiment with those things, of allowing an author to upload a video of any length they want. And some people would upload 10-minute ones, and some would upload hour-long talks. OK, maybe we take, we're really running out of time. We take two comments. And, and well, of course, if this is not the end of the discussion, and I, I hope. Yeah. So yes, Thank please. you. Um, I was wondering, so given the fact that these three conferences can't grow forever, and that it's important to present, whether you've uh, considered the fact that uh, other conferences like Africa Crypt or Late Encrypt or India Crypt could maybe grow uh, instead. So with having, um, there could be several ways to do that, maybe a limit on the number of resubmissions and uh, one, one pipeline among these conferences, maybe by allowing publications at the journal to present at one of these conferences or um, to switch some presentations to these conferences? Uh, yes, I think that would be one very interesting consequence potentially of changing some of these models is that, you know, if, if it's kind of a one shot to the, you know, the general conferences and then we create more of a pipeline for where papers go after that or instead of that. Yes, I think that's definitely, definitely part of the discussion. I don't know that any of the concrete proposals on the table deal with that explicitly, but I would expect that to be part of the sort of organic uh, outgrowth. Thanks. So maybe one last comment or question. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm strongly in favor of the idea of having videos for every talk. Um, I think um, maybe there's also a benefit to having them kind of short as they are now presented on the conferences. So very often uh, the technical stuff that we do is very formal and not very accessible, particularly to very younger students. So here's where um, the benefit of those talks is that usually focus on intuition. So I think um, they accompany the more technical, um, like waterproof 
submissions very well, but also have a quick access um, to what's actually happening in the community. So I think, uh, in general, that is something that, that we should maybe keep always and also maybe in a short format. I think we see yeah. pretty decent viewing numbers on the, on the videos as well. Yeah, so yeah, we're optimistic that that will continue to be a valuable resource. I, I, administer, I administer the YouTube channel for ICR, and there's a surprising number of views for those videos. I think this is a very powerful uh, like position where much of the publication of the knowledge dissemination can be done on, on YouTube. We don't have a TikTok channel. <laughs> So thanks for yeah. the suggestion. So <laughs> maybe we're going to stop here. But uh, so thanks to all of you for your inputs. And of course, we need more discussion and, and more solutions, of course, or a lot of technical details that should be discussed. Hope we will have a discussion, I don't know, during the membership meeting at crypto and then Asia Crypto and so on. But thanks a lot for the discussion.